This is the first in a series of videos, highlighting the many battles that Harry and Meghan are fighting on multiple fronts, and what this War of the Windsors is costing the royal family. One of the first battles to come to light, was that of whether any child of Meghan would be giving a royal title at birth. This was a short battle that the couple lost, but the victory for the House of Windsor was Pyrrhic. The decision not to grant any child of Meghan a royal title at birth, has thrown up a red flag, suggesting that the House of Windsor is still plagued with institutional racism, and this video explores that possibility. Historically, the Royal Palace has faced accusations of institutional racism, but every time an incident occurs to suggest that, the palace and their defenders simply issue denials, and hunker down until the media storm blows over. For the record, institutional racism is covert in nature, and the racial bias only becomes evident, when reviewing the outcome of the application of the institution's rules, customs, and practices over a sustained period, and along racial lines. While those racial groups that have been treated unfairly are acutely aware of the bias, those who have been sheltered from it are not, and Harry's eyes were only open to the institutional racism inside the House of Windsor, after he married Meghan. By way of an outside example, it took the publication of a report that showed that black people were 40 times more likely to be stopped and searched by the police, for the police and the wider public to acknowledge that systemic racism in the institution accounted for the wide disparity in the application of its stop and search powers to the disadvantage of non-white communities. But the members of those communities that the police were targeting did not need the report to tell them what they were living through. So, the racism lies not in the rules, but in the racial disparity in their unequal application, and the ones who deny, or are ignorant of it, are the ones who have been shielded and are benefiting from it. Now moving on to the matter of Harry, Meghan, and their children. Predictably, there was a public outcry after the Oprah interview where Meghan revealed that, before her son was born, questions had been asked about what color his skin would be around the time that they were informed that he wouldn't be given the title of prince at birth. Many denounced the royal palace as racist, while their defenders astonishingly accused Meghan of lying. The unhinged accusation of lying, rested on the spurious claim that, because the rules did not provide for Archie to be a prince at birth, Meghan must be lying. However, the red flag of institutional racism is raised by the fact that, while Meghan's son was not the only member of the royal family, not to have been entitled to a royal title at birth, he was the only member of the royal family for whom that rule was not amended. A simple review of the application of the sovereign's discretionary power to grant royal titles at birth, since its creation by Archer's great-great-great-grandfather, King George V, in 1917, shows that Meghan's son was at that time, the only great-grandchild that the Queen did not grant a discretionary royal title at birth. However, Archer's great-grandmother herself, was the first beneficiary of a discretionary grant, when in 1948, her father amended the 1917 decree, so that her children could have royal titles at birth, which they were otherwise not entitled to, under the decree, because the title was passed down through the male line. Outside of discretionary grants for unborn children, the Queen also made her husband a royal prince, in 1957, even though her father had declined to do so. Their relationship had attracted controversy and reservations because, Philip had no financial standing, was foreign-born, and had sisters who had married German noblemen with Nazi links. Returning to the issue of discretionary grants to unborn children, in 2012, the Queen herself made material changes to the 1917 decree, by amending it so that, any child born to William, would have the title prince or princess at birth, regardless of gender. This was contrary to the 1917 decree, which provided for only the eldest son of Charles to have the title. Significantly, the Queen also changed the rules of succession by putting female children in the line of succession. It is reasonable to conclude that there must have been discussions about extending the same latitude to Archie, otherwise there would have been no reason to inform the couple that he would not be granted one. Critically, in the Oprah interview, Meghan never accused the royal family of racism directly, she simply recounted her experience and people drew their own conclusions. There is no denying the fact that Meghan was speaking the truth because her husband who attended that interview with her, subsequently confirmed it, and nobody has since refuted their account, and it is a matter of record, 
that the title was not granted. The claim that the royal court was just following the rules is the age-old cover that is routinely rolled out to mask institutional racism. This is because, as we have set out before, the decree has been routinely amended at the sovereign's discretion, and Meghan's son was the only one who his great-grandmother chose not to exercise her discretionary power to make a prince at birth. It is therefore reasonable for people to draw the conclusion that the decision not to grant the title of prince to Meghan's son, at birth, after musing about what color his skin would be, is evidence of institutional racism, by the white members of the royal palace who made that decision. Tellingly, the royal palace saw fit to make material changes to promote gender equality, and extend the title to all Archie's cousins, but after due consideration, did not see any reason to make a token change, to amend the rules to promote racial diversity, and grant Meghan's child a title he would inherit on his great-grandmother's death. Astonishingly, not only did they completely reject this opportunity to promote racial diversity, but they also then colluded, to drive out the only mixed-race member of the royal family and her children. In so doing, the House of Windsor, appeared to have given little or no regard to how this would come across, to the wider multicultural public in the United Kingdom, the 14 other Commonwealth realms, Meghan's home country, and the rest of the world. Perhaps, they would be well advised, to consider a cessation of hostilities, to allow them time to survey the battlefield, and reflect on the old adage, that a house divided is doomed to fall. In later videos, we will focus on other aspects of the conduct of the royal palace, that clearly suggest institutional racism, so those who are not subscribed yet are invited to do so, so they can be notified when those videos are published. Thank you for your kind attention.